from uh, Tasmania, and I am uh, broadcasting from Monterey, California, USA, the other side of the world. My name is Keith Rutsar, and I'm the executive director of the California Kelp Restoration Corps, a California membership nonprofit. I'm a lot of things. I uh, almost made it to Tasmania for the National Centro Stefanos workshop, but I couldn't board the flight without a visa, and that took five days to get it. So um, I'm a master diver for nine years, training citizen science divers and pushing divers in the water from boats. And I'm also a licensed general contractor working for Sal O'Brien Engineers. So today, I'd like to uh, welcome to this special international webinar that's been set up here. I have very little to cover and a lot of time. Wait, reverse that. For today's agenda, um, I'll tell the story of unforeseen and unprecedented events and speak in detail about the giant, giant kelp restoration project in Monterey. We'll explore monitoring and results from scientists, and we'll look forward to future expansion. Uh, we'll review a summary of the Certified Kelp Restoration Diver Program that can be used for efforts around the world, and we'll have uh, quite a lot of time for uh, Q&A at the end. So on the west coast of North America, we experienced unprecedented marine heat waves from 2014 to 2016. Global warming is denied by 8% of the U.S. population, but they are very loud. <laughs> so beginning in 2013, we saw the die-off of 22 species of sea stars, including the multi-armed sunflower star. The sea star waste and disease caused the sea stars to disintegrate and basically turn to goo. Their arms would go in different directions and um, these species were, were decimated. Massive sea star die-off affected all of the California regions all at the same time, and sunflower stars became locally extinct. The urchins didn't seem to mind the heat and created a huge spawning event in 2011 to 2013. You can see how this indicates a second year of, of growth uh, for the sea urchins. In 2014, purple urchins overpopulated and created the barrens in Sonoma and Mendocino counties in Northern California and around the Monterey Peninsula in Central California. In this June 2007 aerial, uh, you can see the extent of the kelp canopy in South Monterey Bay. And all this brown out here is our usual giant kelp in this region. And now you can see that in June, same month, 2017, the kelp is barely visible. You can see a little bit of it here, but uh, not as much as it was before, that's for sure. And that is uh, around the peninsula, there are 800 hectares of urchin barrens on rocky reefs. The urchins have now spread 160 kilometers south, just wrecking the Big Sur coast. At, at one of the Fish and Game Commission's uh, meetings, I printed this research out and showed the commissioners this map that shows how the kelp has decreased in a single year. You can see here these large amounts of kelp, that very large heat signature, and then here is the result, uh, very little in the following year. So in California, we have different kelp than in Tasmania, or so I'm told. 
the canopy forming kelps are ideal habitat for many species. Giant kelp is a perennial and has spores at the base, where bull kelp is an annual and has spores at the surface. Giant kelp is a, is a forest that grows vertically and horizontally on the surface. In Monterey, we have deep canyons offshore that bring up coal nutrient rich water, which is ideal for kelp growth. Giant kelp is the fastest growing marine algae and can grow up to a half a meter a day. We can get new kelp starts in Monterey year round in our region when it is cold enough. This is an interesting picture here. Someone made it out of many pictures stitched together to, to show the entire kelp as it goes to the surface. When the urchins are super abundant, they get hungry and they just pour into the kelp forest. In a short period of time, they consume everything right down to the bare rock and where they're almost touching each other. Oops. Living in this beautiful kelp forest is a one spot fringe head, a lemon dorid, cockerels dorid, ronquil, opalescent nudibranchs, and squid eggs. Urchins eating a hold fast, they eat it from the inside out sometimes. They get buried and they eat it from inside out. And you can see how the urchins live in these holes that they've created in the shale reef by wiggling back and forth and, and waiting for the kelp to, to drift by and they can grab it and bring it to their mouths on the other side. Wildlife Nation with Jeff Corwin uh, came out and uh, we found thousands of large red urchins that were munching on kelp and we were able to remove them. The urchins, they eat the thallus of the brown algae and the rest of it just washes away and you're left with these little, we call them volcanoes. Here you can see a rainbow nudibranch, a, a young of the year rockfish, a, a one spot fringe head, beautiful fish, and a bat star. And, and they are really displaced by this urchin horde that comes in and eats all the algae. And the urchins don't benefit from this arrangement either. On the left is a purple urchin from a kelp forest, and on the right is the urchin from an urchin barren. They are starving, but they won't die, and sea otters are just too clever to eat them. The lack of kelp in the north and at the northern Channel Islands has caused the collapse of what used to be a thousand fishermen strong industry to only 1.5 million pounds of red urchins landed annually now. It's complete collapse. So the question is what predator is supposed to keep urchins in balance? So we have sea stars, lobsters, crabs, a sheephead, which is a fish, and eels do eat some urchins, but in this ecosystem, the apex predator is the southern sea otter. They eat 25% of their body weight every day. They eat the healthy macroinvertebrates in the kelp forest that would eat the algae. They're adorable, period. But they were hunted from 1741 until 1911. There were 300,000 of them, they estimate until there was only 55 of them that managed to uh, survive um, at one place in California. When they were nearly extirpated, the urchins and the abalone flourished and ate the kelp. Due to the grazing pressure on the kelp, 
1852 to 1882 navigational chart shows there was only kelp in the sheltered area at the Monterey Harbor. Then Chinese and Japanese immigrants started fishing for the abalone. Over the course of 125 years, they put those abalone in cans. Market forces are stronger than biological forces. The baseline of kelp in my diving experience was the result of kelp restoration by abalone fishermen. That restored kelp allowed the southern sea otter to survive and grow to a population of about 3,000. That is the lesson of fisheries. If properly motivated, humans will take an overabundant native species and make them really hard to find. So building on this premise, in 2018, we started the giant, giant kelp restoration project at Lever's Cove. From left to right are our superstars, Wendy, Nicholas, Stephen, and myself with shorter hair, uh, Jessica, Shizzy, Chow, and Linda, and many more uh, citizen science divers joined us in, in our first year of the project. Looking at reef check data, you can see that where the kelp drops off and the urchins increase, they cross at six urchins per square meter. To return the system back to a kelp dominant state is supposedly an order of magnitude less, or 0.6 urchins per square meter. So reef check researchers designed uh, an urchin density prescriptions on a logarithmic scale. This is a logarithmic scale to determine at what threshold density would the kelp return? Counting and calling urchins at 20 locations over time, the urchin numbers could be manipulated and held pretty close to design. This was only possible because of the sand between the patch reefs. We saw some kelp give life a try, but they were quickly eaten by the urchins. Bull kelp and giant kelp recruited and persisted year to year on our lowest th threshold density target. This is me pointing at that kelp and I was really surprised and delighted and, you know, look ma, I made kelp. So, love that picture. So in 2019, we were calling purple urchins only, but we found that the red urchin population exploded by over 300% when the purple urchins were removed. In 2020, we removed both the red and the purple urchins and the new kelp settled and survived. In conclusion, when we removed both the purple and red urchins to less than one urchin per square meter, kelp could grow and survive. And, and most importantly, that the volunteer divers can do it. So experiments are interesting, but we were watching kelp forests turn into urchin barrens every winter. We realized we needed to petition the California Fish and Game Commission. We first submitted in 2017, uh, Bruce Watkins and myself, and uh, this was denied. And we revised and resubmitted in January 2019, but this was denied. I'm hearing a, a clicking sound in my speakers. Is that OK? It stopped. So thank you. Um, we resubmitted in January of 2020, but this time many people spoke up in favor and over 260 people sent heartfelt letters of support. The commissioners relented and urchin calling at Tankers Reef became legal on April Fool's Day 2021. 
we proposed expansion after our first year in November of 21 and and that was denied. We wanted to work in popular well-known dive sites, but they were they are in marine protected areas. The only spot they would let us call urchins is Tankers Reef. And it is the most eroded beach in California. It's T Tankers Reef is a big open shale reef with a sandy shoreline. Anchored on Tankers Reef in this picture in 1908 is the Great White Fleet that Theodore Roosevelt sent around the world December 16th, 1907 to February 22nd, 1909 to spread peace, love, and understanding. There were 16 battleships with the hulls painted white. The fleet visited New Zealand and Australia in August and September of 1908. In 2020, we started the giant, giant kelp restoration project at Tankers Reef by amending the sport fishing regulations to allow licensed recreational divers unlimited take of purple and red urchins by culling them with hammers. The goals of the project are to do the project safely, train divers to cull urchins properly without harming other marine life, reduce purple and red urchin densities below two per square meter in the treatment area. The Department of Fish and Wildlife and Reef Check California monitor our work to see how well we are meeting these goals. The benefits of the project are to establish a giant kelp forest at Tankers Reef, provide a giant kelp spore bank for future kelp forest recovery, and to monitor changes in the kelp forest community. And of course, to provide habitat for southern sea otters. In this map, you can see the red line around this area, and that is the enforcement boundary from the amendment. The site is divided into the control area on the east, where no calling takes place, and the treatment area where divers call the urchins. The mustard color is where kelp has existed at some point in the last 30 years. The green color right here is where we found kelp in April of 2021 when we started. The lime green box next to it is the cable grid for navigation by culling divers and scientific monitoring divers. First, we did a lot of reconnaissance, and this was done by pulling a GPS device at the surface while diving underwater and taking notes. It's like um, um, flying a kite in a forest, right? It's very difficult to do sometimes when there's a lot of kelp. When there's urchin barren, it's easier. But this gave us an idea of where to bolt the grid down to the bottom. And there was a little bit of kelp uh, in both the control and the treatment area at the outset, but most of that disappeared pretty quickly as in the year. So there are two methods to call urchins at Tankers Reef. On the grid, divers go down uh, assigned lanes and call the urchins, recording how much area they covered and how many urchins they called and how much time it took. And on the grid, uh, on, on the buoy, the divers first uh, travel down a cable uh, to a spot, to an assigned spot, and then go perpendicularly to that line. So what that looks like is, is that a six acre kelp forest formed on the northern part of the grid and further um, to the northwest. The, the thick lines here indicate where the divers worked on both the grid and at the, at the orange buoy, which is, has the line on it. As we worked on the grid, we determined that the kelp forest must be kept alive to provide 
one, drift algae that would suppress the urchins, and two, become reproductive and spread the spores with the usual swell that goes to the southeast. We cleared all the way from the grid to the orange buoy. We connected those two areas together. We worked in some of the gaps on the grid and went around the perimeter of the kelp forest to try and defend those urchins that were invading it. Defend the kelp that was being invaded by urchins rather. We worked on the grid as well as south and east of the grid. As squares are hard to defend at the corners, so we would send the new divers uh, in training to start their first dive at the corners. Again, we're going around the perimeter while hitting the grid really hard. The, the kelp forest extended south of the orange buoy as a response to our efforts over in, in this section of it. We directed our attention onto the grid uh, in preparation of the after surveys that were to come in September. So we spent a lot of time working in this section and south of the grid and just along this perimeter, keeping them from coming back onto the grid. And these surveys were coming after Labor Day, so we really were as thorough as we could to try and, and clear the number the urchins off that grid. But once the grid was turned over to the surveyors, we turned our attention back to the kelp forest to the north and cleared out the urchins thoroughly uh, between the help uh, between the kelp holdfasts. We went deep into the kelp forest using urchin carcasses as breadcrumbs to keep us going straight. The, the trick is to not go out too far and get flanked by the urchins that are reoccupying the space. The urchins seem to be pouring in from deeper water from the north, so we concentrated on meeting them as they entered. December, there were a lot of storms that that kept us off the water. Then the surface where the urchin densities were highest in the lanes. So we directed the divers to go to those places as a priority. We used scooters to remeasure the kelp forest and found that we were losing ground at the orange buoy as hordes of urchins came in from deeper water. You can see how the kelp forest has transitioned now to a start in these spaces over here. And we worked in the kelp forest that was also on the grid as well. And eventually we conceded that we could not protect the kelp on the on the west side of the site. But we found that kelp grew in areas closer to shore and in acid weed beds. So kind of show you in summary what happened is Because within the culling limits of the, that's the blue hat shape on this map here. The light blue color is the kelp forest that formed in 2021, and we worked hard to keep it alive. The brown color is the resulting kelp in 2022. This year we are seeing kelp grow in places we didn't even call, but where urchins vacated towards our kelp forest. Ed, trapezoid shape here, I'll draw your attention to that. That is the limits of a drone survey. So on April 7th of 2021, Cal State University, Monterey Bay did a low altitude drone survey. And you can see where the kelp exists on the northern part of the flight path trapezoid, north of the little boat. 
there's a little, I don't know if you can see that right where my pointer is, there's a little boat right there, and you can see where the kelp is on this end. 17 months later, you can see how the kelp has moved to the southern part of the grid, south of the boat. There's the little boat, and here's that little hat shape. The kelp spores spread with the typical swell from the northwest, and they went, from, they, they made all this kelp over here. And what does that look like from is from 200 feet? You can see that this is now the biggest kelp forest in Monterey, and this is what it looks like from 200 feet. And you can also see that there's no other kelp around this. This is where the kelp is. We tagged kelp with little embossed tags to test if they could survive. The kelp west of the site died, and we found the tags later. The kelp on the grid, it survived and actually grew the holdfast over the tag, so we couldn't find the tags anymore. So it was a, a nice experiment that um, had some difficulties. We also track early colonizers like native species of algae, Desmarestia ligulata, also called acid weed, and invasive bryzoans that would have been eaten by urchins if we had not beaten them with the hammer. But in if uh, if our southern hemisphere hosts find this bryzoan familiar, it is because it is from your neck of the woods. Came to California somehow. And we also track the appearance and foraging behavior of the southern sea otters on the site. Just as a little aside, recently, like this last two weeks, we have seen 150 sea otters in South Monterey Bay. And while that's, you know, cute, um, that's way too many sea otters uh, for this place that is beyond its carrying capacity. It's a real crisis for the sea otters right now. So we have awesome results to share. We have about 186 certified kelp restoration volunteer divers called 563,000 urchins in 900 hours and 1,200 dives. You can see that at first the numbers grew quickly and then leveled out due to weather. And now in the maintenance phase of the project, the slope is reduced as urchins become hard to find. Reef Check and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife are monitoring the results of our effort on the grid. However, most of our effort was around the grid, stopping the urchins from pouring back onto the grid. So we concentrated on finding high urchin density urchin patches for the greatest efficiency. Calling urchins is a year round task and is especially needed during the winter when the urchins have exhausted the turf and drift algae and changed their behavior to eat live kelp holdfast. So, the, give you the bad news first. The control site urchins remain remain plentiful and the giant kelp remained scarce i've i've never been to the control site i i hear it's awful on the treatment site we brought the urchin numbers down and voila the kelp returned So during this project in the first year, uh, we experienced a marine heat wave. Our normal temperature for diving in Monterey is 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 to 12 and three quarters centigrade, uh, centigrade. And that warm water was nice to dive in, but the kelp did not appreciate that. The, the water turned green and then turned red, and we had a red tide. A, a red tide makes a, a 
boat traveling th through it looked like Willy Wonka's chocolate churning river boat. We have had to call dives on account of blackout conditions. The red tide also feeds the bryozoans that live on kelp, and this degrades the kelp further until there are just stipes caped, uh, caked in growth, and eventually they become little bushes with only a few bare stipes. So erosion rates along South Monterey Bay shoreline between Moss Landing and the Wharf 2 in Monterey are the highest in the state of California. After the, the CMEX plant, uh, there were sand mining plants in this region that would uh, remove sand uh, and make concrete and, and play sand. And these uh, CMEX plants, these uh, sand plants were eventually closed. And the last one to remain was CMEX. And to give you some idea, CMEX removed the equivalent of 70 football fields. Uh, I don't know if that's <laughs> uh, three feet deep, right? So it's a huge amount. It's in, in cubic yards. I think it's almost like cubic meters. It would be 360,000 cubic yards of sand was removed. And this in this is where the river comes out and you can see where all the sand is impounded in this place and uh, eventually this sand is going to come down this littoral plain as it normally would and it's going to cover our site with sand in this area that we're considering is at the tankers reef site the bottom substrate is soft shale and mudstone and and the kelp only lives for two or three years on that kind of uh, benthic substrate on the places where we would like to go on granite reefs where kelp can stick to the rocks it, it lives a lot longer it lives seven to eight years uh, on a granite substrate and what that looks like is you can see several giant kelp hold fast they just shear off in a storm and this was happened in uh, april of 2021 our first year and but the shale is so brittle that the kelp can actually pull up the entire rock uh, from the bottom it's very lightweight material in the future we would like to work in better places with shore access but unfortunately these places are all designated as marine protected areas where no invertebrates can be taken you can take all the fish in the conservation areas, but you can't take the species that wrecks the habitat for the fish. And all of these marine protected areas are swamped with urchins and are not really productive anymore. It's 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 beyond sad. We thought it was a good idea to make these areas, but they worked against us by protecting the urchins from us and making certain areas have healthy and productive kelp forests, which provided more food for urchins and higher urchin reproductive potential. Uh, these urchins spawn their larvae out from Point Lobos and wreck the Big Sur coast to the south. Right, our next proposed sites are at the Monterey Harbor and two sites in, in Monterey Bay and uh, two sites in, in Carmel Bay. These sites presently have a remnant kelp forest to defend and are accessible by shore. So, so we have proposed to the Fish and Game Commission in California a kelp restoration project expansion this spring. The G2KR will, will do the treatments and uh, Reef Check California will do the scientific monitoring. And we are proposing to call urchins baiting and do some baiting and trapping urchins, commercial restoration by harvest of purple urchins for urchin ranching, managing acid weed, removing invasive species, kelp planting and transplanting, and prohibiting fishing in restoration areas. So we need divers. Lots and lots of divers. 
For this, we have created two kelp restoration distinctive specialty diving certifications that can be taught to entry level divers internationally. The prerequisites for the class are an open water certification. You have to be comfortable diving in, in Monterey. It's cold water, about 20 dives in cold water. And you can maintain some neutral buoyancy and ability to use a compass uh, to navigate. You'll learn about kelp forest versus urchin barrens, sea urchin anatomy and behavior, effective conservation minded urchin calling, how to plan and conduct a kelp restoration dive, uh, reporting invasive species and other disturbances, where to dive at Tankers Reef, and how to collect and report data. Uh, the class is open to market forces and the class costs uh, anywhere from $150 to $375 uh, US dollars, which is about $217 to $542 uh, in Australian dollars. You'll also need to bring a sport fishing license. Uh, the license fee went up this year, eight and a half percent, you know, inflation. And uh, so now it's fifty eight dollars and fifty eight cents US dollars or eighty four dollars and eighty cents Australian to give you some idea. Uh, you need to buy a hammer. Hammers are cheap. Cost between six and fifteen dollars uh, US or uh, eight sixty nine to twenty one seventy one in Australian dollars. So in other gear, you'll need a small slate to record your data. Uh, shears or a knife. Uh, surface marker buoy a whistle and some clips for holding the hammers uh, tight to your body. Now this is the layout of the underwater cable grid with the buoys. On this place, uh, the divers get assignments and they call the urchins in lanes. So they begin at one end and go down this way. And there's tape measures on the lanes. They can tell how far they've gotten and record that data and it's put back into uh, the database. And then that's how they log their dive through an online data portal. You know, originally we we're gonna go out as a big group and then COVID came and then we adapted it to be that people could do this online and get assignments without having a big event. And um, you know that that adaptation for COVID made made all the difference and it made um, it set us up for success in, in having these individual assignments where we didn't have to have all these events. So um, what you'll also learn in the instruction, you'll you'll learn in the curriculum that it takes to learn this is about two hours on Zoom and uh, one or two dives uh, with the instructor, depending if you're a Patty or a Nawi uh, person. Uh, for the calling technique, you need to crush the urchin so that it cannot continue to eat kelp. And the divers should easily be able to see that the urchin has been called. It, it is now very hard to find urchins and divers need to look carefully for the urchins uh, hiding under the algae. And you know, the divers need to touch things. And there are diseased urchins and diseased urchins they may survive the disease and they still eat kelp. So um, it's still a problem. And this disease does not easily spread. And right now it is very hard to find small urchins on the grid. Um, by calling the urchins, we mostly were able to tar target the big ones more easily. And so what remains are a lot of little ones and it, it, they're really difficult to spot on the grid. In December, we went live with a new data portal that was created uh, with our allies at Salesforce. And now it is much easier to register divers. This is our registration portal. And it's easy to get an assignment of where to, to call the urchins. Uh, you'll begin uh, you just go and select one and go to that place. And this is where you would start what meter. Any comments that about the lane or in the assignment portal? And then the divers uh, log that dive and it asks for their assignment and they can fill in their assignment and uh, how they performed uh, on on the grid. 
or the buoy or other areas. That's how that's done. And the awesome thing about all this data is that we can look at it in this data model, which is connecting the divers and the dive logs and dive locations all together with a schema from Salesforce. And we can use this as a foundation for adding additional data, such as weather data and the site survey data from the scientists. You can see it, the urchins called, and this is our work rate in urchins per minute, and uh, how this work rate has trended over time. So, um, and you can also look at it, uh, it has a gamified functionality where you enable the volunteers to view their own metrics. And also this live functionality because the data is pulled automatically and instantly from Salesforce to Tableau. And in the near future, we wanna see how this can be a template to for other urchin calling organizations um, all over the world. So we have meetups for our certified divers and we had 15 meetups so far. Um, it's a good place and time to meet new dive buddies. Uh, we provide snacks and hot soup. And uh, it's a discovery uh, for divers who are considering the course, but not sure. But we only allow uh, one meetup uh, for that experience. And uh, we have great parking. It's landscape. It's beautiful. And, uh, and it's great access from, from shore. We offer incentives for divers to call urchins on the Beach Hopper 2 every weekend and the, the first Saturday of the month. We, we do monitoring and night dives on the project. Uh, night dives are really fun. Urchins are nocturnal. And so it's a lot of fun to go out at night and um, get them on the sand uh, where they are. Uh, this is only for the certified kelp restoration divers and instructors teaching the course. Uh, the discounted fare is only $50 or uh, 72 dollar ruse dollar dues dollar dues sorry i don't use the word so anyways um this forest fire was fought by plane and helicopter just offshore from our kelp restoration project site there is not a forest service for the kelp forest nobody is coming to put the fire out it is up to us Kelp sequesters 20 times more carbon than trees, makes oxygen, dampens waves, and reduces beach erosion. Kelp is drought tolerant, and it doesn't burn. And kelp is full of life. Myself up here and you down under, we are all connected. And now is the time for big things. So go giant. I would be remiss if I did not thank all the volunteers for doing the actual work and to our many collaborators and allies. We are happy to add more organizations to this page, including our new friends at the Kelp Forest Alliance and the Kelp Forest Challenge, which we have pledged 800 hectares of restoration by 2030. So, Thank you. Uh, here's my contact information. You can visit our website, uh, like us on Facebook, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, Kate. Just wanted to say thank you for that and acknowledge your use of dollary roos. Dollary doos. <laughs> dollary doos. I appreciated that. Um, <laughs> There, we have got a little bit of time for questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, and there are a couple of questions to get us started in the chat. So um, I don't know if you can see them there, Keith, or I can read them out too, or I ask people to. I, I can, uh, should I stop sharing yeah. my screen then? So I can see them. Uh, sure. Yeah, let, me, let me do that so I can see you better. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm actually that. just going to stop the recording as well. So oh, let's we do don't... that. And then I'll look in the chat here. Oh, SMR, very good. 